Okay, so can you hear me if I uh, stand here and do this? I actually brought Joni with me. Joni is a retiree. Um, she is also a medical social worker, and she um, has retired from the military, as has her husband, and they have a special needs child. So she has lived the life and walked and talked what needs to happen with you guys. And, and my impression is that probably she's going to be more valuable to you than I'm going to be. So I'm going to go through the slides, which are relatively short, to give you kind of an overview of the systems that are in place for you. And then we hope to have enough time for her to be able to jump in at certain points or to be able to add some things as we go along. So our topic <clears throat> is finding resources to support your family off base. Uh, we went through and listed a couple of community-based resources. They include Regional Center, Exceptionally family, Exceptional Family Resource Center, Public Health Nurses, and we're going to talk a little bit about funding sources, Medi-Cal, SSI, IHSS, Regional Center, and we're going to add Medicare. Um, does that pretty much hit the questions that you guys have for funding sources? Anything else anybody wants us to jump into? Not right now? We're good. Okay. Regional Center. Regional Center is what it's called in San Diego or in the state of California. How many of you are going to states other than California when you leave? Okay. In most instances, you should be able to Google into um, the state departments, and the departments you want to look for are either the Department of Health or in the state of California, the Department of Developmental Services. Department of Developmental Services is the special needs population. Um, in the state of California, that's what it's called. They, in turn, contract with separate nonprofits. And in our case here, that would be San Diego Regional Center. It's the focal point for coordinating services for persons with developmental disabilities and their families. It is a state-funded, private, nonprofit organization which contracts annually with the Department of Developmental Services to provide services to consumers. We gave you the information on how you would go about applying to San Diego Regional Center. And we put all these things with resources in your packet so that if it's relevant to you, you can go ahead and follow through with that process. Exceptional Family Resource Center. Uh, offers emotional support, resources, and information for families of children with special needs throughout San Diego and Imperial counties. This is basically the counterpart of EFMP in the civilian world. However, they are um, able to give you resources and plug you into other things to work with it. Everyone who works at EFMC, e EFRC, excuse me, um, generally speaking, is a volunteer, except for the core staff, and they also have exceptional, in, exceptional needs children. So you're talking parent to parent to someone else who understands what's going on and what's happening there. Uh, we have the information for those phone numbers, which are in your packet, depending on which area you are in. Yes. My suggestion to you would be to go ahead and start now. Um, there is nothing that precludes you from being a San Diego Regional Center client or consumer at this point in time. And I would strongly encourage anyone who is active duty even to go ahead and start that process. There's one thing that's really important about um, San Diego Regional Center that a lot of people don't know, and that is something called institutional deeming. Sounds like a horrible word, right? Let me tell you what it does. What it does is it identifies a child or an adult that uh, you can segregate your income as the parent from that child. And they look at that child as if they had a separate income. Um, they identify them and then they qualify for a number of benefits through regional center through their lifetime. Generally speaking, they want to address this for kids that are over the age of three, but if there's a specific set of things that happen or a specific diagnosis, they will do it under that. The real reason you want to have that happen is because that qualifies your child for Medi-Cal separate 
and apart from your income and you. And that means you're going to qualify for all of the other components, both as Medi-Cal as a secondary insurance, but also for programs like EPSDT. Anybody heard of EPSDT? EPSDT stands for Early Periodic Screening and Testing. Early Diagnostic Periodic Early periodic diagnostic screening and testing. For those of us who have to remember things funny, just remember every president should destroy their tapes. <laughs> it works for me. Um, but anyway, what that does is that qualifies your child for hourly nursing care, um, either in a center like Together We Grow or in the private home. And that's basically a lot of the counterpart in uh, the civilian world to your ECHO program. Ma'am, you have to be careful with that because under EFMP, um, on the base, if you're receiving EFMP services, uh, such as the, the 40 hours a, a month, uh, the regional center will cut you off from the... Uh, yes, there's some the offset. Center. So you have, to be, you have to be careful with that. And then if they do that, you won't make IHSS um, or will be... They, they tried it, we, we fought it, you have to fight for it, but you can do it. Uh, okay. You have to be careful with that. I agree. I'm going to let her address that because she knows the ins and outs of that better than I do. But thank you for that information. Yes? Fantastic. So you have a resource right here in the room, which means if we have any um, SDRC questions, we're going to defer to you because a lot of, if you can, a lot of what we're trying to do here is just give you resources and information for things and how can you adjust from one kind of sets of rules and supports to another. Now, our, our key issue is to make sure you don't get dropped in the middle. Okay. So the next area is public health nurses. And we've written in there uh, the different services that can be provided by public health nurses, as well as we've given you for San Diego County the public health nurse contact information. If you were going to another state, you would go into and Google their information for Department of Health Services, and then you would specifically Google for public health nurses to get the name and the numbers of where you would get that resource. Now we want to talk a little bit about funding sources. Medi-Cal, uh, even if you have private insurance, your child may qualify to receive Medi-Cal to cover things that are denied through your private insurance. And then we talk about the steps to go through to start Medi-Cal. Uh, call the County of San Diego Human and, uh, Health and Human Services Agency Information Unit, and we've got the other information there for Medi-Cal. Um, supplemental Security Income. Uh, SSI is a federal income supplement program, and I'm going to hold off on talking about that a little bit because that's going to be Joni's portion. Regional center, um, we've listed some of the things for the regional center, including how to reach them, and we're going to defer back to the gal in the back of the room. If you want to join us, if you've got anything that you would like to add to that, you're welcome to. And then just a, a brief thing for Together We Grow, we're a pediatric day healthcare center here in San Diego and Oceanside, and we do provide programs for the kids under Medi-Cal, um, and uh, we're able to resource that. And regional center. And regional center and the school districts and some TRICARE and a couple oddball things along the way, but we, we are able to go ahead and see what we can help to do with that, including we do see the respite 40 hours. Uh, at times can either be done at home or in our center-based program. I'm going to now switch over to Joni because I think she's got more stuff to add for you for IHSS and SSI, and then we'll have some time for questions. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Joni. I'm a retired corpsman from the United States Navy. I did 20 years. My husband is also a retired Navy corpsman. He did 20 years. He currently works at Children's Hospital. He does CAT scans and x-rays. We also run um, a lot of, we do a lot of 
we do a lot of fundraising. I couldn't say the other word real quick. Um, for Children's Hospital, we actually have part of the hospital named after my son, and I'm very proud of that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, oh, and I also have two sons in the military. One's a Navy corpsman on the USS Macon Island on his second deployment, and I have one who's in the Marine Corps. Both of them went to Afghanistan at the same time. Hence, I have gray hairs that I now cover. Um, <laughs> My youngest son is my special needs. He was born overseas with hydrocephalus. He was medevaced back from Italy to Walter Reed, and then he was transferred to Children's Hospital on the East Coast. He's had over 100 brain surgeries, so his list of diagnoses, and I know all of you can understand this, start with hydrocephalus, two VP shunts. Currently, he's had up to four. He has cortical visual impairment. He also has um, severe mental retardation, which is the classic DSM, that is a specific DSM diagnosis. Um, he also has asthma, osteopenia, which is weak bones because he is wheelchair dependent as a result of cerebral palsy, and the list goes on. But I'm here to tell you he's the cutest, cutest guy, and he laughs every single day. Every single day, and I often tell his brothers, get rid of your attitude, your brother's not complaining. And if anyone's got something to complain about, it's him. So what I want to tell you is everyone's experience is going to be different with all of these resources because each of our children are very specific. Each of our lifestyles are very specific. I've already learned some stuff sitting in the other room. Things change over from when I retired. I retired in 2001, so it's been a few years. Um, so things change. So what I've learned today is I need to keep a little more current and keep up on some things. The other thing that you guys already know is you learn best from each other. So you constantly need to be reaching out to someone who's about three or four years ahead of you in age. Because that's the parent who's going to walk what you need to do next. Okay, what I'm currently receiving for my son, and it hasn't always been, is we are in TRICARE Prime, retiree. We now get IHSS. The first two times we applied for it, we were ineligible. But we now get, actually we get quite a few hours. We get almost 205 hours a month in IHSS, which is a, a, really a large amount. We went from not being qualified to suddenly being 205 hours a month. That's a huge amount. Does anybody else have IHSS? Does anyone have that amount? Do you have that amount? Yeah. So most people don't qualify. So that kind of gives you a nutshell of how severe my son is disabled. Is anybody here wanting to apply for IHSS? In home supportive services, it's every state has a version of it. Every state has a version of it. In the state of California, it's called IHSS, in home support, supportive services. And you just want to Google that. It originally started out as a program for elderly to provide in-home supportive services, shopping, cooking, transportation, to help an elderly person stay in their home. Twenty-some years ago, it expanded to cover disabled. Um, and that's probably the bulk of the program now is mostly the disabled population. What it does is two things. It allows me to take care of my child. I'm no longer able to work full time. I was a CPS investigator, 60, 70 hours a week. As you can imagine, doesn't allow me to manage all of my son's health care needs. So I had to quit my job. But that also cost our family a big chunk of our income. That's when we became eligible for IHSS. So that makes up for some of the income loss for the care that I'm already providing my son. He has a G-tube, he has seizures, he has all these other issues that need to be managed. He's diaper dependent. So I actually get paid, are you ready for this? In, in our county, because each county pays different, by the way. In San Diego County, it pays $9.50 an hour. So it's a supplemental income. But now the other option you have is to have someone off the registry come in and help you care for your son. They then would actually be paid for that service and not you. You do have to declare it on your taxes as income if you're the recipient of, if you're the one providing the care. So once a year, a social worker comes to my house. I have to go through everything. I provide them with a list of every medication, including lotions and sunscreen that I apply or give to my son, PRN, Tylenol Motrin, the whole nine yards. I provide them a medical statement, which I'm going to suggest that each of you get, which is a list of diagnoses, every single diagnosis my son has from his doctor. 
and I'm going to suggest that you have one of those in your file. I update mine about every year. I use it when I fly overseas. I give a, here's a TSA, here's a list of my son's diagnosis. Oh, social worker, here's a list of my son's diagnosis. Oh, for, you know, whatever program, I have that list of diagnosis. One page. It's a medical statement. So IHSS is a program I'm going to encourage any of you. Because my son is institutionally deemed, our income for Medi-Cal doesn't count. So I encourage, does anybody have their child institutionally deemed already? Okay, and again, it's going to be based a little bit, and I'm going to say this in the cold, harsh reality of the world. My child is so disabled, so challenging to take care of, that if I wanted to, I could put him in an institution. But I'm saving the government money by caring for him myself, so they're, therefore, they're going to ignore our income and give us the medical support for Medi-Cal. My son has Medi-Cal and TRICARE Prime. I use both facilities, Children's and TRICARE. I have no co-pays. Haven't paid one co-pay in 10 years. Between the two insurances, it's been covered. Has that been your experience too? It's a beautiful thing. I've never even had to pay that $3,000 that retirees have never even gotten there. It covers my DME between Medi-Cal, CCS, familiar with CCS, and California. California Children's Services, it's where you're going to get your physical therapies, wheelchairs, things like that. CCS is going to help pick up where ECHO leads you. Those of you who are going to leave ECHO, ECHO paid for all of your DME, CCS, and Medi-Cal, and TRICARE, between the three of them, are going to duke out who's going to pay for what. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions for me? I'm trying to think. I was writing some down earlier. Yes. For autism, um, I actually have a friend who's getting a hundred. For which program are we talking? We're in right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to be a little dated on this because when I was on active duty, we had program for persons with disabilities, and it's slightly different than ECHO. Okay, so I'm not as up to speed on everything that ECHO provides you. I can tell you this. My experience was when I left active duty between CCS and Medi-Cal and TRICARE Prime, I experienced no loss. But I'll also say this. As two corpsmen, we do an awful lot for our child. Do you know? So I don't have the specific answer. Do you have the answer to that yes, one? Yes, I do. Regional Center. Regional Center is who you would go to. They do uh, probably 80% of the funding from Regional Center. Help me out here. Um, autism. I'm sorry? Okay. So a lot of the autism care that I see now given in the community is through Regional Center. And it's a huge portion of their population. That's correct. And again, that's why I said I'm going to speak specifically to my experience because each of us have very specific experiences. Each of us have very specific needs. Who can stay home? Who needs to work? You know, as a social worker, my husband's, good. My husband's always going to make $50 an hour compared to what I made as a social worker. Guess who gets to stay home? You know, two-year degree versus seven years. I don't know. So it's going to be a little specific to each one. I, I want to step back a second for IHSS. Um, those of you who want to go to apply for it, I'm going to give you another little harsh reality. One of the things you don't want to do when that social worker comes to your home is you don't want to take at that moment to talk pridefully about everything that your child can do. As parents, we want to focus on everything that our child can do. This is the one time you don't want to do that because it's actually going to hurt you to qualify. This is the one time you want to be very specific. He cannot brush his teeth. He, because IHSS is going to, the way they do it is almost like a secret society. They're going to pay you for menstrual care. They're going to pay you for diaper changes. They're going to pay you 
for um, breathing treatments, for feeding pump, for supervision. I have a friend whose child has really not very many medical needs, but he's severely brain damaged, so she gets about 180 hours a month because he's left to his own devices, he would be a harm to himself at his age. The other thing that happens with IHSS is things change as your child ages. For example, things that you would normally do for a three-year-old, laundry and, and food preparation, diaper changing kind of, they're not gonna pay you for it three. At 14, 16, 17, most children at that age should be able to do their own laundry, prepare their own meals. So then it changes. And they do a thing like, well, you're gonna get one-tenth of an hour for this. And it adds up at the end of the thing, and then you get a lump sum. And they give you a breakdown of it, but how that's like paramedical services. Then you have to go research, what is that? So that's why I want to warn you. I don't think you need to become a better expert than them. I think you just need to know that that's not the appointment where you want to brag about what your child can do. That's the time you want to talk about how challenging it is. Okay, does that make any sense on the IHSS? Okay. I want to talk a moment about institutional demon and regional center from a my perspective. I'm going to strongly advocate that you don't allow your case to ever be closed from regional center. I, very, I see my social worker at regional center once a year for about an hour. But that, because he's a regional center client, it opens huge doors, especially when they turn 18. You can't at 25 go back and become a client of regional center. And if you're not a client of regional center before you're 18 or 21, I'm not sure what the current rule are, maybe you can specify, you can't get it. That opens a lot of doors, especially for the more higher functioning kids, for group home, semi-independent living. So if you lose that pearl, and I'm gonna call it the pearl, because that also gets you institutional deeming, that takes care of every copay you'd ever have with TRICARE, with Medi-Cal. So that's why regional center is the pearl you don't ever want to give up once you get it. If you don't have it before they're 18, you want to get it. And they get tougher to do it. It gets, it's not as easily screened for. I mean, like all government agencies, they're battening down the hatches and they're, you know, yes. You should be able to transfer. Doesn't transfer because it's a California thing, but this is what they told me. They said just make sure that you keep in contact with us. Like what you're saying, make sure we have an address for you. At least once your contact is because they said as long as we know where you are, we will not close or fire. They kind of like put it on hold. Absolutely. That's why it's extremely important before the age of 18, and then try to keep that file open. Don't let them close you out if you can avoid it. Advocate strongly, as I know you all do. Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Uh, do you know what the difference is between uh, a waiver? Uh, institutional deeming waiver? And institutional deeming. Uh, because we did, the, we did the waiver so that they don't count our, our incomes for my son. Correct. Is that, is that a difference? Same you? thing. Institutional deeming... Basically, your child is eligible to be institutionalized. Right, but we, we have to do that waiver every year. Every year. My waiver comes in December. I file for Medi-Cal in March. I always keep a copy of what I submitted last year, pull it out of the file, keep a copy of that, put it in there, send them the original, and then that way there's not a problem. Like clockwork, December and March for me. And each of you guys should have that set up with your regional center workers, the one who gives you that and then your Medi-Cal will be your anniversary date. So always make sure you get it a month or two before your Medi-Cal anniversary date. Yes? Um, two things. One, if, if you don't get your, if you don't get what you're looking for out of um, regional center ITSS, there are appeals processes. Yes.
Absolutely. Right, and in my own case, here's how I talk to my, my social worker, and that's exactly what I'm trying to point. Okay, my son cannot even roll over on his own, so technically I should be changing his position every two hours. Reality is, I don't get up every two hours every night, 24 hours, but that's what he requires. If he doesn't make it through the night, then I, I obviously get up and I rotate his position. But the reality of it is, and what I tell the social worker is, he needs a position change every two hours. Life is real. If we get a four-hour stretch of sleep, we're getting it. Okay? So, I mean, but that's exactly my point. It's not the time to brag about their accomplishments, and each of them have them. It's the time to really talk about the challenges. And the 24 hours, seven days a week is the way to go. Did you have something to add? Um, actually, we're getting the hook. Oh, sorry. So, um, what I wanted to just add real briefly, uh, one of the things that's been really successful for you is the respite weekends. That Absolutely. Are break. So, if you want to just give us two minutes on that, we're set. Okay. Respite weekends, I choose to have my child not to have in-home nursing. I like my home to be a sanctuary. I prefer not to have to clean my house before someone comes. It's like cleaning before the maid comes. It makes no sense to me. So... I use out-of-home respite care, and I've used Together We Grow for 14 years. Um, there are a few other facilities like it in the U.S. For some of you, you just may have to Google it, or maybe, Terry, you know of them, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but I've been very happy with the care. And there's some safety considerations that I really like about it. If my child has behavior issues, no one person's going to get tired of them and maybe react negatively towards my child. If my child um, requires, you know, a two-person lift, I don't have to worry about using up double hours to have two people come into my home. That's available at the, at the respite facility. And I have to tell you, the staff turnover there is really low. There's people that have cared for my son for 14 years, and they know him. It's a beautiful place, and the new building's been designed to take care of our kids. So if you're staying in the area and you want to work or you want those respite weekends, in the last couple of months we've gotten together with other parents and we go out and have dinner and a few drinks, and we all know our kids are, are safely taken care of at the same place. Has anyone else used, I know you've used, has anyone else been familiar with Together We Grow? Together We Grow is a nice facility, and I like it because there's more than one set of eyes, because my son can't communicate. So that's why I, I use the facility. I really want to promote that. I also want to give you um, my contact information. Um, you can reach me two ways. Um, my website that we're connected to Children's Hospital, where we do do a lot of fundraising, and I'm very proud of that, um, is www.liamsfund.com, L-I-A-M-S-F-U-N-D. You can reach me through that, through my email there. And then also I'll give you my email, but don't get mad at me. My husband gave this to me. It's really long. It's Joni, J-O-A-N-I-E, Devgutz, D-E-V-G-U-T-Z. So it's Joni Devgutz at att.net. So if you have any questions or anything you want to share with me, I'd be glad to you know, communicate with you via email.